We're also joined by Mary Crawford, Early Years Educator, Wonder Years Child Care Letter Kenny. We are also joined by Pauline McGuire, Head of Academic Operations at Portobello Institute, Judy Lenan, Marketing Manager at Portobello Institute, and Dr. Margarita McGinnis, Program Manager of Masters and Postgraduate Programs in Early Childhood Education and Inclusive Education, and also Lead Lecturer on the Bachelor of Honours Degree in Early Childhood Studies at Portobello Institute. So, Firstly, and without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to our esteemed keynote speaker, Paul Mosley. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so just to give you a sort of brief background with regards to my sort of career in forest schools, I was originally sent on the training um, by a wonderful, beloved team leader when I was a countryside ranger who knew that I loved to be out in the woods with kids and I loved being in the forest and teaching crafts and things but they really didn't have any understanding about what it was. Um, very quickly I learned that forest school is all about being with people and being with places and so when we start to think about this idea of inclusivity I think it very easily becomes something we can see that's at the heart of forest school. So I've been involved with Forest School now for about 15, 16 years, something around that area. Um, I've been a trainer for a number of years. I've trained about 4,000 practitioners, fortunately enough to do that all over the world, from America, New Zealand, Australia, Malaysia. Um, and more recently, over the past year or so, I've been an advisor to the Forest School Association. And earlier this year, I was voted onto the boards on one of the trustees as well. So I'm going to share a little presentation. What I thought would be useful, um, not knowing necessarily the level um, of understanding maybe some of you have with Forest School, that we'll sort of work on two things at the same time. One is look at the structure of Forest School's pedagogy and then also look at how it particularly lends itself to inclusivity. Um, if anyone's interested in, in sort of reading further, the Forest School Association does have a book called Growing a Forest School from the Roots Up, which you can find on the website. Um, but like I said, the, the, for me, forest school has always been about inclusivity, both in terms of who it is that you're nurturing, but also the space. So we'll start off by just looking at the definition of what forest school is. So forest school is a child-centered inspirational learning process that offers opportunities for holistic growth through regular sessions. It is a long term program that supports play, exploration and supported risk taking. And it develops confidence and self-esteem through learner inspired, hands on experiences in a natural setting. So as you go through the principles of which there's six, You'll obviously look into those different areas and define them a little bit more. But I just wanted to touch base with this first because Forest School is used in a number of different ways. Um, it's become a sort of bandwagon to a certain extent, um, the intention of which is completely understandable. However, the sort of logistics of it become a bit problematic in people starting to feel that anything that's outdoors with children is for a school. Now, certainly everything that's outdoors with children is fantastic, but it doesn't necessarily make it for schools. So the six principles that we're going to be going through this evening are really designed to define the boundaries of for a school. And that's not to say that if it's not for a school, it's not amazing uh, experiences, um, but it's just to try and make sure that people understand where within different pedagogies they are perhaps placing themselves. OK, so firstly, principle one. Forest School is a long term process of frequent and regular sessions in a woodland or natural environment rather than a one off visit. Planning, adaption, observations and reviewing are integral elements of Forest School. So this is perhaps one of the more challenging elements to Forest School, uh, particularly when starting off. We're very, very used to and there's been an increasing popularity with this idea of, of taking learning outside, which is amazing. But one of the ways that perhaps Forest School slightly uh, sort of stands separate from the others is that by definition, it is about long term. And by that, we mean 
you know, 12, 24 weeks, ideally throughout the seasons and ideally over multiple years. Because as we get into the other principles, we'll understand in order to achieve what it's trying to achieve, which is that inspirational uh, growth, it's quite hard to do that in a one-off session. You can have inspired learning, particularly in relation to you know curriculum topics. It really brings it to life. However, to achieve what Forest School is trying to, that really does take this idea of a community and the long-term experiences in order to achieve it. So a couple of the areas that I've pulled out uh, within principle one, the sort of sub criteria, if you like, um, that I think particularly lends itself to this idea of inclusivity. So Forest School takes place regularly, ideally at least every other week, with the same group of learners over an extended period of time, if practically encompassing the seasons. So I use this term community a little while ago. Often Forest Schools are referred to as programmes. You can see actually in the next paragraph down. Um, but really when we break it down when we step away from that particular term. In essence, what we're trying to create is a community. Now with that, with this long-term nature of for a school, it gives us an opportunity to really get to know who it is that's part of that community. It gives us an opportunity to take a step on from just providing some activities. Um, for me, the term you know, activity has this sense of there's a beginning, middle and end to it that's largely predefined. There are also you know, things that can happen along the way, but there is a, a, an intention from the very um, beginning of where things are going to end. And to a certain extent, the value that we're going to gain from that as well. So I tend to like use the word um, experiences. And again, with program, it has this idea that there's a, a formulation to it. There's a, an overriding structure where there certainly is within Forest School, but I think the intention is about something more, which is about this idea of community. Now, obviously, we can all think about people that we've perhaps walked past in the street in the last couple of days or the workplace even, um, perhaps even in the university, and you wouldn't necessarily know them from anybody else. And then we can think about the people who we're closest to, that we are you know, very intimate with emotionally, who we trust, who are trusted by, who we feel that we can open up to. Uh, about ways in which we feel vulnerable, perhaps. That's really what we're trying to do in Forest School, is we're trying to get to the point where we have this sense of community, where we have this rich relationship. And because that's the intention of Forest School, it means that by definition, we're trying to be inclusive. We're always trying to look for how can we engage with them as individuals and how can we help those individuals feel connected as a community. And so by definition, the entire point behind Forest School being long term is not only to obviously create opportunities to be in the natural world, but it's opportunities to be amongst people who are moving towards this point of community, moving towards a point where every single person is recognised for who they are, for their authentic self, but also then recognised as part of that community itself. So the initial sessions of any programme establish physical and behavioural boundaries and make initial observations on which to base future programme development. So this idea of we are creating a community, so we need to have agreed ways in which we're going to uh, navigate that space. And this is where the opportunity is there also to be able to recognise people's needs, whatever that might be. Um, it could be needs based off fear, it could be needs based off uh, their physicality, uh, it could be needs based off all kinds of the different experiences they've had just that week, let alone over the previous few years. And so the whole structure of Forest School being based on observations is so that we can then start to work with them collaboratively and we can start to look at how we can help them feel comfortable with who they are, to be authentic, feel comfortable with the people they are with, that sense of community, and then also move forward into helping them feel comfortable with where they are as well. So principle two, forest school takes place in a wooded or natural oops, um, environment to support the development of a relationship between the learner and the natural world. So there's a particularly interesting uh, dimension, if you like, 
to forest school practice well really to any kind of outdoor nature-based practice but forest school in particular kind of leans on this notion which is that in the natural world in the natural spaces that we can access there are certain opportunities there's certain qualities to that space and those materials which perhaps are not present or, or less available within indoor environments um, Often on training, I will do an exercise where I'll invite everybody to go off and find a stick. Um, usually that actually prompts all kinds of conversations about the difference between a twig and a stick and a branch and a log. But once we've resolved that, um, they then go and find a stick of some kind. And then we just explore all the different ways that we can interpret the way that we can experience that stick. And very quickly, obviously, things like a back scratcher comes up in terms of what we can do with it. But then we start to explore things like what other kind of physical properties do they have and how can we experience them so we can start to employ the senses what can they be in terms of you know fantastical and imaginative uh, resources so we can talk about you know the our little friends that live in the forest we can talk about the fact that it's a dragon's bone um we can talk about it being um you know all kinds of different creatures or tools that creatures might use but then we can also start to talk about the practical ways and we can use it the tools that uh, humans can kind of lend it towards and this can involve everything from you know the famous back scratcher to um, we can roast marshmallows on it we can light fires with it we can create pot hangers we can build dens with it etc and then we start to go off and explore these different tangents what questions might we have about it and how do we sometimes rush quickly from the questions and focus perhaps too much on the answers? So one of the things that Forest School does in having this natural space is that it can be an inquisitive place. It can be focused on inquiry rather than knowledge acquisition. And so whilst there are opportunities to perhaps find out what is that particular beetle which we all experience going through the grass, there is ample equal opportunity to just explore what is that beetle why do we think that beetle is going this way what is it thinking at the moment what is it thinking of you um, and so we can explore all of these questions and, and one of the roles of a practitioner really is to bring out the richness of exploring and to make sure that that can be inclusive of everybody that it's not about getting towards a particular curriculum outcome it's not about attaining a certain piece of knowledge or mastery of a skill or knowledge of a you know plant um, community etc it's all about what are the interesting questions that we can explore and what creative ends does that uh, maybe even lend itself towards and then we can get into some quite philosophical ones um, i've had a, an amazing experience where in being asked by a young child about a particular branch on a particular tree they went away and they read into that this entire story where it had parallels with what they were experiencing at home at that moment and so when they returned the next week they were actually able to articulate things that were happening to them which they hadn't previously because they could see this story parallel with them and this particular branch on this particular tree uh, and what it also helped them do, which was the real sort of uh, amazing inspiration moment, was they were able to figure out what they needed to change in how they approached everybody else within the community in order to change the conditions in which they were growing. And so we think of the, the natural space not just as something to use for play, although obviously play is an incredibly important area. We think of all of the different prompts that can occur that could lead us down many many different avenues and so there's a few different ideas that are important when it comes to the natural materials and this idea of being inclusive which is that we've got lots of loose parts okay there are lots of things in a even reasonably healthy outdoor space that can become points of engagement and they can be used in lots of different ways but another important quality is that they have what we call compound flexibility which is that a stick hasn't been designed for any particular use. We have to interpret it. We have to maybe even um, adapt it, um, reshape it maybe in some way, or change our ideas and how we were going to use it originally. And so there is this great dialogue that occurs. And one of the things that's always been inspiring for me about Forest School and what I've experienced is that you will see those that perhaps 
feeling left out in some circumstances, whether that's you know socially or whether that's academically, they suddenly find a way of being able to engage with that dialogue with those spaces, with the materials of those spaces as well. And then they can start to author their own stories and their own uh, learning journeys. So principle three, Forest School aims to promote the holistic development of all those involved, fostering resilient, confident, independent and creative learners. So looking back over the, the previous two principles, we start to really kind of understand now, OK, this is what we're aiming for. It's not about the acquisition of knowledge. It's not about the acquisition of skill. Um, shortly, we'll talk about tools and fire where it's not about the tools of fire themselves. It's about what it creates. Um, it's about who are we helping shape here? What are we nurturing in who they are and how they see themselves and how they see the world around them? That's what we're really interested in terms of forest school. So even if we have thrown out a few ideas at the beginning of a session, we are fully hoping in the back of our uh, minds that actually they've all got better ideas than us. If they don't, if the weather's you know a little bit inclement, if it's cold, if it's raining, if they've not slept, if they didn't have breakfast that day, for any other reason, they've always got our ideas to draw on. But we're hoping that they will start to see how they can engage with the space, how they can engage with each other. And we really become the most useless person out in that forest. That's a secret hope for all practitioners because then we've we've accomplished what we're sort of setting out to do we're creating this sense of community we're creating a sense of place and then from that our role then becomes about adding in supporting and nurturing rather than leading so one of the key points that we all spend quite a lot of time trying to you know communicate to new trainees is that you may start off leading because the outdoors might be a space that is intimidating might not be known to them um, certainly the specific space that you are uh, introducing them to might have certain things to it that they need to know for example where the boundaries are um, where they can go and play in the stream and where it's maybe not the best place to go and play in the stream all of these kind of things we are introducing but we're always introducing with this idea that this is about giving them the opportunity to author their own stories their own learning journeys to work as a community and perhaps make decisions. Now, obviously, that's dependent upon sort of the age range that we're working with. But in general, what we're trying to always to move towards is this idea of autonomy, this idea of we want them to be confident with who they are. We want them to be confident with who they're with and we want them to be confident with where they are, because then they can really lean into all the opportunities that are there. And that takes um, not a lot of time with some and a considerable amount of time with others. So whilst we have that community that's moving forward as a whole, we might be playing very, very different roles with different learners within that community. And one of the things that we need to do is we need to understand who they are and what they're experiencing in that space. And so we might need to recognise that for some, there are some social challenges that they're trying to overcome. For others, it might be emotional. Um, and yet for others, there might be interesting spiritual aspects. And so by spiritual, we tend to kind of be very inclusive with that notion, this idea of, you know, the existential. Who are we? Why am I? Where where are we? Does this matter? And again, with Forest School, there really is an opportunity to explore that. And obviously, allowing the learners to lead what they're interested in exploring there. But for example, when we start to talk about the animals that share the space, we can actually start to nurture this sense of a kinship. And there's a whole separate conversation about nature connection and the difference between nature connection and kinship, but very, very um, sort of broad, broad strokes at the moment. This idea of really being of a place, of having a sense of place that uh, it matters to you. Um, these kind of spiritual aspects are a, a wonderful opportunity within forest schools to, to create something beyond just their character, but how their character is in relationship to the land around them. So principle four, forest school offers learners the opportunity to take supported risks appropriate to the environment and to themselves. 
So forest school opportunities are designed to build on the individual's innate motivation, positive attitudes and or interests. So again, this is a, a further sort of a criteria of a, of a different principle that's putting at the heart of forest school, who is it that you're working with and what are their interests and what is driving them? Now, some days um, what's driving them is, is a need. And it isn't about creating nice photographs to go on a website to show how fantastic a forest school practitioner you are, um, <laughs> although they are nice to have. Um, I've had the experiences whereby I've had a very well-intentioned, incredibly professional you know, head teacher storm across a field to the um, urban of forest we were in one day, demanding to know why a particular child was just sat underneath a tree. And what had actually happened earlier on was that that child, because I had been able to get to know them um, because of the privilege uh, you know, allow, afforded to us through forest school practice, of actually being able to spend really good quality time with them. She'd started to um, open up about some things that were happening at home where, you know, parents were separating, etc. And she said, oh, I just need to chill out for a bit. I said, well, this is forest school. That's what you need to do. That's what you can do. And so they just went and spent a little bit of time partly processing what was going on. And, you know, this is one of the few times where you know, they had some space to be able to do that, but also just allowing the environment to kind of uh, nurture them, to um, you know, allow them to relax in a way that's quite unique in terms of the outdoor space. And so everybody else understood that. Everyone knew that, yes, you can go over and invite them to be involved with what you're doing, but also understand that at the moment, this might be what they need to do. So we're always trying to find out what are their innate motivations. What is it that interests them? And that can change. That hasn't got to be a project that they've got to run for a number of weeks. That can be something that captures their attention at that particular time they're out in forest school. And then something the following time could take them in a completely different direction. And as I mentioned earlier on, this idea of the tools and fire, which again, some people with the best of intentions confuse anything involving tools and fire and children and the outdoors is forest school. With forest school, we use the tools and fire not so that they learn how to light fires amazingly. It's so that they are challenged. And if they want to light the fire, they have to learn how to light the fire. And we don't shy away from challenges. So we can think about challenges in terms of, you know, the social aspects. If someone speaks out or, or has a different idea, there's a social challenge there for them to explore. If they are challenged by something that they want to accomplish, there's an emotional challenge there. And so when we've had people come through forest school communities, I'm not interested if they ever go and light a fire ever again. What I'm interested in is what have they learned and what have we nurtured in who they are as a human being through fire lighting, if that's what was interesting to them, that they then will carry on for the rest of their lives, hopefully. Um, but again, those kind of things we introduce once we've got a really good sense of who is it that we're working with? Here? What is it that I need to be sensitive to? How is it that I need to support them? And what role does, does tools or fire have? Maybe it doesn't have a role at all. Maybe they're just not interested. But if there is some interest there, how do I as a practitioner feel it's going to be the most appropriate to introduce that to them? Uh, and what is the, the important work that we're going to try and do with it? And so the last criteria here, um, forest school experience follows a risk benefit process managed jointly by the practitioner and learner that is tailored to the developmental stage of the learner. So that's a fancy way of saying we figure it out. Um, as we will all have experienced, I'm sure there are some children that we can trust with fires, with tools. And I've worked with, uh, you know, 26 year olds as part of a, a police gang related program that I am not yet ready to allow to use tools and climb trees. Um, so it's it's about that getting to know, it's about that uh, inclusivity and understanding who every single individual is that allows us to be able to figure out how are they capable in their many, many different nuanced ways and how can I recognise where they need me to provide support and where they are able to lead. Principle five. Uh, there's a high ratio of practitioners and adults to learners. Forest school is backed by relevant working documents and the forest school leader is reflective 
uh, as a practitioner and sees themselves therefore as a learner too. So obviously principle five here is all about preparation, reflection, and thinking about what is our practice? Is it appropriate to who we're working with at the moment? And what kind of support structure is there for them? So this idea of high ratio of practitioners to learners is, is very, very important. Um, you can take a class of you know, 40 children out and run a fantastic sort of field studies based program uh, where they're learning how to identify things, where they're learning how to do, you know, gather data. With forest school, because we are looking at some of those really sensitive areas in life, we're looking at their social confidence, their ability. We're looking at their, how they perceive themselves, the value they give to their life and their accomplishments, where we're trying to understand what is it that they're experiencing and where are they feeling challenged and how do I support them as individuals as well as communities? That means that we can't really take out 35, 40 children at a time. The maximum I ever personally take out, and even then I've got at least one, which is the bare minimum, I would prefer to have two or three, is 15. Because even if I had, for example, you know, a ratio of one to two, if I was to take out 40 children, even with a ratio of, of you know, um, uh, one to two, then I still can't get to know those 40 children. So the reason why we recommend a maximum of about 15 is that you as a practitioner, you as the person that's really trying to hold that space. And even like you know, we discussed earlier on, this idea of we're trying to lead where we're needed rather than when we assume we should and try to step back over time. We're trying to be as inclusive as possible. So that means that I need to know all of them to a good degree. And then with that, I've got all of my documentation. I've got everything, which, as I always tell people when I'm training them, means that you can walk out into that space and you can be fully present. So there is nothing worse, I think, than having doubts at the back of your mind in how you're working or where you're working or who you're working with, what happens if there's a problem. All of those things need to be resolved before you step out into the woodland space, because then you can be fully present. Then you can really be inclusive, thinking about who it is that you're working with, what do they need from me right now. You can be fully present. But then also, as part of being a forest school practitioner, as part of it being about this genuine, authentic sense of being together, there are going to be times where, in hindsight, you perhaps could have made a different decision. Um, and that's an integral part of forest school practice. It's about recognising that it's a conversation. It's a conversation between you and the space, the natural world. It's a conversation amongst the community of practitioners and learners. But it's also a conversation between yourself and your own practice. And so I think one of the things that Forest School really prides itself on is this ability to say, we are going to go out and we are going to understand as best as we can what it is that we can provide and nurture. But then we're always going to revisit and we're going to look back at our practice always and try to see where can we move forward with this? Where do we need to make a different decision? Where do we need to follow a different journey? And there are times where groups can actually be your best source of reflection. When you have a really good, authentic relationship with them, when it really is to that point of it being a community and you're all equal within it, that's when you can actually start to ask them questions about, am I providing you with you know, what you need? Is there something different I can do? And obviously, depending on who you're working with, some of them might be able to get back into that conversation and they can tell you how you, they need you to help them. And then finally, principle six. Forest School uses a range of learner-centred processes to create a community for development and learning. So this really kind of underscores everything that I've been talking about so far. Everything in Forest School is learner-centred. So everything from how we run the session, you know, is there a gathering at the beginning, at the end, both? How do we like to do our lunches or snacks? Where do we store this? Which tree is the best climbing tree? All of these different things are all about how do we move forward as a community? How are we inclusive to the point of we're trying to step back always to allow them to lead in ways that are appropriate for them? Um, play and choice, integral part of Forest School. Um, we pride ourselves on the ability to make it look as though we're really not doing anything, 
but actual fact we're creating the learning space we're nurturing those choices that they want to make we're making those observations but then absolutely crucially we have reflective practice and that's reflective practice for us like we talked about in principle five but it's also reflection for them so with forest school one of the cornerstones if you like of forest school practice is helping them understand their own experiences helping them understand what are the kind of things that they've been doing why did they matter why did they feel how they felt about them do they always kind of feel that way when they had those experiences so i remember having a young child who was incredibly nervous about meeting other children for the first time and, and then in a reflection they actually shared that they were always really nervous because they assumed other children were always going to not like them and always pick on them and that obviously opened up about experiences you know that they were having elsewhere but in sharing that we were able to then actually address it and all of the other children as soon as this was mentioned you know really assured that no that's not the case we we really like you we want you to come and play with us and we found a fantastic pile of fox poo true story um that they wanted to share with them and so this reflective practice is not only important for us as practitioners as professionals but it's also crucial for us to be as inclusive as possible and for the community to be able to include each other's lived experiences by having the opportunity to actually understand those so um, that's the six principles of for a school uh, and i hope that's given you some food for thought Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Paul. Um, we'll take questions at the end. Um, but for now, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Mary, Mary Crawford. Oh, yeah, I'm so glad I am following Paul after that. <laughs> um, that was lovely. I, I remember listening to Paul years ago. Um, it was during COVID when I was doing my far school training and you forget the whole inspirational talk and it just kind of makes you remember why you're doing it again first. So I got a lot from that again, but um, hold on, I'm just going to share my screen here now for my presentation. Um, all right, share screen. Hold on, it's floating. Can you see that okay, Andrew? Yes, I can see that. I can see that fine. Yep, yep. Okay. Oh, there we go. So I'll give you um a bit of background into my far school um experience so far. So I'm pretty new to it. Um I basically only started doing it over COVID, um, did my training there. So I work in Wonder Years, it's up in Letterkenny. It's a large outdoor space, which is eight acres. Um, so we are blessed with a forest area, hills, grass, uh, muddy areas. Um, so we currently uh, care for over 300 children each year. Um, but over the years, you know through observations research reflective practice you know we began to see the true value in outdoor education for all children um during COVID, our practice encourages us to make real changes so we are inspected by tusla the preschool inspectors so there was a lot of restrictions was being placed on us um over lockdown when we reopened where they wanted divisions inside the classrooms children some children had to be at one side of the room the others had to be on the other side separated they weren't allowed to mix mingle you know there was recommended that they were meant to wear masks in the classroom and something just didn't feel right with it so we created six new outdoor preschool rooms where the children had the opportunity to be inside the classroom or outside and what we had observed over over the years was that there was a 
first choice for our children was to go straight outside. Um, so during lockdown, I did my far school training and it really changed my perspective then on what outdoor education really was. So although we're inspected and it was about bringing the classroom outside, it was to get away from this idea where we constantly had a set up activities that, you know, the children needed to, you know, do puzzles for working on their fine motor skills. They had to be doing arts and crafts or pencil control. It was, there was so much more behind it. So after our first year, we noticed um, a massive change in the integration of children with special educational needs. And we recorded how their development began to thrive at a faster rate in comparison to the previous years in the indoor classroom. So in previous years with children with behavioural issues or attention deficit disorders, it was stressful on the educator and stressful on the child um, in the classroom environment. Children were overwhelmed with um, too much stimulation, noise trapped inside. Do you know, there was no area, for want of better words, to go and blow off steam or go and just experience nature. So looking behind forest schools, there is an abundance of research. Um, one I was really interested in was Biophilia by Edward Wilson. And it's a theory that humans are instinct instinctively drawn towards their natural surroundings. Um, nowadays, we have what is known as a nature deficit disorder. And it's basically spending too much time indoors, spending too much time on our tablets and our phones, children on computer games are not wanting to basically go outside and it's having a massive, massive effect on their behaviour. So the forest school approach to learning and the outdoors is rooted firmly in the key progressive education theorists, such as Steiner, Vygotsky, Montessori, Dewey and Gardner. And Freubel is one of the bigger theorists that placed a great importance on outdoor learning. He thought that children needed space and light in order to learn effectively. And children developed their understanding of the world around them through direct experience with it. So as I mentioned, the nature of deficit disorder, um, it's the idea that human beings in particular are spending less time outdoors than they have in the past. And this has been seen to have a, a massive change in behavioural issues. So for schools, as an outdoor education is shown to have a massive benefit to children, including children with additional needs. Pip Tree Early Learning agrees that nature significantly improves all aspects of child development, physical, cognitive, social and emotional. Being in nature offers practical centre experiences that are suited to the preferred learning styles of many children with SEN. In particular, children love centre experiences because there's no wrong or right way to play with mud or to play with the leaves or to play with glass, grass, um, not glass. <laughs> and we're in the classrooms, as Paul mentioned earlier, a lot of activities, there's a right or wrong way to do it. And sometimes this can, it can build up frustration for young children who are, aren't able to complete that puzzle or to build Montessori equipment in the right, correct way that they are. Um, Hannon Centre agrees with the outdoor duty as calm and atmosphere. Outdoor education enhances peer interaction, supporting children's social, cognitive and language skills. This includes children with or at risk of language delays and those on the autism spectrum. The Centre for Autism in Middletown suggested enriching Nature of the outdoors makes it the ideal space to deliver play, which stimulates all the senses and regulates the child's sensory needs. So for me, um, when I think of far schools, it's, it's looking back on my own experiences as a child and yourselves as adults. Um, for the emotional well-being, the outdoor places, you know, when you think back on a child, when you built your first puzzle, or played in a home corner or coloured your first picture. They're not memories that's easy to conjure up. Do you know, you think back and go, oh, I think, you know, I think I remember doing this picture. Or I think I remember doing these puzzles. 
But for instance, say when you reflect back on a beautiful summer where you were a child and every child in your neighbourhood was out guns blazing for an epic water fight or DIY slide. Imagine the sound of laughter and squeals of excitement as you hit your target or indeed yourself got soaked. So even over the summer where we had the children out themselves for the one or two weeks back in June where we actually had good weather, the sound of laughter and children playing, it's it, it gives you this good vibe, this good feeling. Um, and the, the children sense that too. It's, especially then like in the, the winter where the snow was inches deep and you and your fr- friends and family work together with great effort to build the best snowman ever. And for us growing up, it was socks we used on our hands because my mother, God forbid, would never buy us gloves. Um, so we were going through maybe 10 pairs of socks in and out, in and out you know, the resilience that you were building out there, you know, you weren't complaining that your fingers were cold or, you know, that somebody knocked your snowman down. You went back out and you made sure that you had the best snowman out of everybody in your your neighbourhood. Another experience for me as a child would have been thinking back to my first camping trip. The range of emotion, you know, you and your friends or family endured while pitching a tent so everybody out there who ever pitched their first tent, the frustration from getting it erected in the first place and the joy when it actually was finally up, possibly very badly at first, but the, with more practice, you got better at it. And then the cooking experience, you know, the relaxation after the storm when the campfire finally got lit and you were able to get your sausages cooked no matter how burnt or charcoal they were. Those were real feelings, Do you know, them experiences, they conjure up real memories that, you you know, you hold dear and every time you go camping again, you, you know, you think about it or you laugh about it and you look back. Sometimes this isn't always possibly the case with a lot of the indoor activities that we prepare for children. They provide skills, but have they got la- life lasting memories, um, you know, to reflect back on, to enjoy. So how the forest school approach and outdoor education enhances our Ashton curriculum. So we are defining our preschools with our Ashton curriculum, regardless of your ethos or what your approach is, whether it's Montessori, whether it's forest schools, whether it's Fryville. Um, Ashton is our guiding curriculum um, that it has to be followed. But Ashton fits perfectly in with forest schools, the themes, so the theme well-being. It's about children being confident, happy and healthy. It focuses on developing as a person physiologically and physically. Um, And that fits well into one of the principles there that Paul mentioned earlier. Identity and belonging. This theme is about children developing a positive sense of who they are and feeling that they are valued and respected as part of a family and community. Going back to the one of the, the strongest points of far schools, that sense of community, you know, the belonging, you're part of a group. Communication, where children share their experiences, thoughts, ideas and feelings with others. Exploring and thinking is based on children making sense of the things, places and people in their world. So how the far school approach in outdoor education can be compared indoors and outdoors. Um, so when the earliest educator really delves into Astor, they begin to understand its true goal and it's to provide children with real life experience to become the best versions of themselves. It's to enhance each child's individually, creativity, imagination and positive as- a- attributes such as resilience and confidence, builds on their strengths and interests and works on improving areas requiring attention. Astor's goal is not to mould into the society correct version we think they should be. Um, so one of like one of a passion of mine is to make sure that the majority of our children are preschoolers coming in and I don't want to destroy who that child is as a person. I don't want them to conform so that they behave the way that I think they should behave or that they should have interest in areas that I think they should have interest in or that they should paint a picture the way I think it should be, like a, a pink pig or a, you know, the cotton wool sheep pictures a child should have the right to design or arts and crafts whichever way they see fit so whether it's um it's about being resourceful for what you have laying out different areas providing them with different 
um, resources, facilities that they can manipulate and use how they see fit. Outdoors is also a fantastic opportunity to provide more opportunities for risky play, which in our cotton wool society, we don't really let children do any as much anymore. Um, fear of insurance, of parents complaining, things like that. But I feel with teaching our parents over the past few years of the opportunities risk provides for children and showing them the learning and development that takes place, um, they, they really start to take it on board. And the more and more that I share my love for it and what they're doing and look at how well their child's doing, they do overcome it very slowly. So activities that we would take part, that we would prepare in a, one of our far school stations. So the children come in the morning and we set up our camp base. Um, so they would have, we have a kit where we bring out. Everything we need in, is in that kit from our wetland to our fire lighting resources, our flint and steels, our cooking equipment. These are carefully put back every day into, into our kit so that the children learn about taking care of their, their equipment, their resources, and the things just can't be thrown about and left and walk away at the end of the day. So some of the, the activities we do, we set up a campfire. We will kind of judge the weather, see what kind of day it's going to be. Is it going to be windy or is it given rain? Is it going to be very sunny out? And this will dictate the type of shelter we build for that day. Um, we have a lot of trees and things like that that we do prune back and tidy up from time to time. Um, and we don't dump these. These we kept in big piles around the place so that if the children want to build their natural shelter, it's there. They're not damaging the trees that are currently growing. So they know if it's lying in this pile, they're allowed to touch it. Our arts and crafts area, if you can see in the top corner where the buckets um, are hanging off the pallet. So these have just twigs, um, mud, leaves, um, branches, anything that we find lying around. And we, we divide them out in the individual pots and set up different areas around that the children can make what they want. You know, is it mud faces on the trees or, you know, doing different designs on the, the grass? Um, we have a bird watching area where the children created their own large bird nest. It's on the top right hand corner in the back side. Um, and it's it's a lovely way. We have binoculars and things that get in it, and we have different pictures attached inside too, so the children can see which birds are, are natural to our area. Um at the minute, mostly for us it's crows. Um, but you know, we can begin to see their patterns. Where do they like to hide? You know, if it's raining, do they go hiding in the trees or what type of food can we make for them? So we would, you know, create different or make different bird feeders and hang them around the trees, especially in winter, because the ground's too hard for children. You know, they can't dig up their worms, things like that. We also build bug hotels. We do whittling with their potato peelers. And even for the preschool child, the potato peeler, I feel at this stage, is ample enough for them to do whittling with. And it's, it's a lovely opportunity for them to make ten pigs or skewers um for making their marshmallows or forest friends. Um we do lots of different arts and crafts what you see in the bottom picture there. And I would do it as well for my garden, different flowers, things like that. And it's it's a lovely way for them to be creative. Having these areas set out, there's no right or wrong way to use them. You can see some children will make um, mud pie dinners and use the different leaves and things I set out. Others will use them for arts and crafts. Others will use them to make patterns in the ground. So it's it's how they see fit. And then also the cooking. So when they're out in their far school session, we provide or we prepare the area. So we make sure it's a nice clean area they, they start working from. They get out all their equipment. They will prepare their own snacks and food themselves. And they are then responsible then for helping with the cooking, getting the fire started, um, all supervised with the adult in place. So for a lot of services out there, especially more so in the Dublin area and a lot of the big cities, we, we don't have the abundance of outdoor areas. Some, a lot of them, we have tarmac areas where it's just, there's no area for you to do natural, natural play. Um, 
So what we also have done in our indoor classrooms is we've invited the outdoors inside as well so that there's a nice transition from both areas, um, especially on the, the more stormy kind of weather or, you know, when it's freezing fog, things like that. And up in Donegal, we have that nearly every other day. Um, so one of the big things I would do in the indoor classroom is, first of all, remove plastic clutter. Every earlier setting that I have visited over the past few years, we have the best equipment. Everything's brand new. It's all plastic. And sometimes it's overwhelming for me as an adult going into this. So I can only imagine how overwhelming it can be a child with sensory issues. So removing the plastic clutter creates a more common natural environment. Add indoor plants, trees and hair powers to the classroom area. Include water fountains, um, wooden wind chimes and play sounds of nature available on YouTube. It just gives it that feeling that even when you're indoor, you're still getting that common environment or common kind of feeling that you would get outside. Not as much, but it brings it about indoors. Create sensory trails um, with trays on the floor with pebbles in it. Um, grow grass in big trays, soil, water, leaves, and leave these on the floor for the children to take their socks and shoes off, walk in through them, have the feeling of them, um, so that everything doesn't have to be clean in your, in, inside your classroom all the time. It's um, Sometimes we're so worried that everything is sprayed down with antiseptic at the end, you know, every five seconds, every time a child touches it. The natural dirt, it's it's not going to kill them. At the end of the day, tidy up your classroom, reset it up for the next day. Build indoor fort, huts, shelters using tarp sheets or light blankets. Um, when we were all children, we used to do it over our kitchen tables or over chairs where we used to hang blankets and things like that. Have boxes of these items, you know, readily available for our children that they can use these and manipulate them whatever way they want. Make their own huts however they see fit. Hang out cut out pictures of local birds from your ceiling so when the children come in the birds are above them um have your binoculars ready they can make their own and another lovely idea which you know is it's lovely in the classroom as well so each day you could have maybe different footprints so maybe it could be bird prints on the the ground taped to the ground and whenever the children come in you know maybe get them the you, you know ask them you know who who do you think was visiting our room last night what kind of prints are these are you know have it more inquisitive that when they come in it's like they had a visitor last night I wonder how can we prepare you know the next day for them will we have a wee bird feeder in here or will a wee bird bath or setting up lovely activities like that so you can extend outdoors inside um create nature tables and sanitary baskets from item, items collected on nature walks or from items children bring from their own home so sometimes you may not have the resources available to you outside. You may not have trees, grass, mud, but I'm sure there's at least a few children in every classroom environment out there that has a nice garden that will bring in a wee lunchbox with something in it. And it's lovely too to share that experience from home. That's almost like, you know, you're working together with the families and the children has a sense of pride that they have brought in these things to show you. Nature arts and crafts, for example, mud faces on cardboard, nature crowns or wooden stars. Tea light s'mores, whittling with potato peelers, knot tying activities and nature weaving, tough trays with mud, leaves and sticks, and grow grass and trees for a small world area. Um, so there's just a few different pictures of some of the activities that are lovely to do with the preschool, indoor or outdoor. You can have them both set up for. Um, Forest School Northern Ireland has a fantastic page where they have these um, templates done out, you know, how to make birds nests, forest friends, rock match. And it's just a lovely way to kind of give you ideas, especially for the preschool child who is new to nature. So even having wee books and things available for them that, you know, they can they can experience it at a, a young level and develop that appreciation and respect for nature and understanding the importance of leaving no trace. So there's a few books that I absolutely love that I would use in my forest school station. And one is the Laura Brand, Slow Down and Be Here Now. And it's a great way for children to just stop and appreciate the small things in life, like finding a ladybird and how many spots is on their back or seeing if we can see any bumblebees and are they 
on the, the flowers, you know, gather nectar or is there any birds up in the sky? So it's, it's all just about slowing down, stop rushing through it, stop thinking you have to have an activity done every day and just enjoying the moment you're in. Another book is If You Find a Rock, and that is by Peggy Christian. And it's basically about whichever different rock you, you find. Is it a wishing rock or a pebble for throwing in the, the lake or the, the water that bounces off the ground? Um, and it just, it's showing children imagination that this rock is so much more than just a simple rock. The last book I absolutely love is In the Forest by Anouk Boyce Robert and Louis Rigaud. And it's about the cutting down of our forest and respect in nature that if all the forestries are cut down and things are built up, then we're not going to have any more homes left for the birds and the trees or the hedgehogs or the foxes or squirrels running about. And it's it's a beautiful way to get children really thinking about how we need to protect our natural environment and our woodland area. So our progression and plans for the future. So last September, we opened a further three new indoor outdoor classrooms for our two year old groups. Um, so the same opportunity that we have provided for the preschoolers, children have the freedom of choice to go inside or outside, whichever they desire. And for most of our two year old children, once the doors are opened, they are outside. Um, Wonder Years is also currently in the process of opening a second establishment in Donegal for this September. And our pedagogical ideals and aspirations will be carried over to the service. And with more and more of our parents and families experiencing the real benefits outdoor education has to offer, we are hoping in September 2024 to expand our ideals further with new outdoor classrooms and enhancing training for educators to support more for school ideals and risky play experiences. This may be So that is me, um, not as inspirational as Paul, but a little bit more practical for how I put it into practice in our service. Uh, well, thank you, thanks for that, Mary. Um, could you stop sharing your screen, please? Well, thanks, Mary and Paul. Those are both very, very um, fascinating presentations. Just have a few questions there in the chat. And if you have any uh, questions for Paul or Mary, you can pop them into the chat now and we'll do our best to facilitate them. So um, there's one person there. Um, can you please repeat the name of the book of the first book from the author, uh, Laura Mary? Mary? Yep, yeah, so it's Laura Brand. You saw no Russell Brand, the comedian presenter from England. And um, so it's his wife and it's called Slow Down and Be Here Now. It's an absolutely, it's a beautiful book and it's just so simple about slowing down and appreciating the small things in nature. It's, um, it's lovely. Uh, thanks, Mary. Uh, with the emphasis on outdoor and experiential learning within the forest school framework, how do educators address potential challenges related, related to accessibility, accessibility and safety, ensuring that all children, including those with disabilities, can fully partic participate and benefit from the approach? And that's from Sarah. You want to get her, me, Paul? Me? Um, so for instance, like when we first start up a session, we would have boundaries. So we have different areas set out for different levels. So a two year old, the area is secured off um, with high fences around the whole outdoor area. Um, simply because the two year old, it's, they're not as likely to listen to you at that stage. For our three year old preschoolers, this area is much larger. So they have more freedom, they hide, they roam but it's always within the safety of the children at all times. And then once we have the four-year-olds, we have a large outdoor forest area that is not secured. Um, but what we do is at the start of the station, we have I have stop signs on sticks. So it's just a basic stop sign. And I give a say, for instance, Andrew, I'm going to give you this stop sign and I want you to walk as far as you can until I can't see you anymore. And we're all going to help together. So once Andrew's far enough and we think he's too far away, we're going to, or when we think he's far enough, he's going to, we're going to shout stop and he's going to put the stick in the 
he's going to put the stick in the ground at that area. So next up, I'm going to give Paul a stop sign. Paul, I want you to run way over that direction and we're going to get you to put the stop sign in there. So guys, where Paul and Andrew set, set up the stop signs, we don't want you to pass any further because after that, it's very hard for me to keep you safe. So when the ch children are setting their own boundaries, um, they're more than likely to stick to them rather than me going, guys, this is our outlay. I don't want you to pass these lanes. Nobody's allowed to pass them. If you pass them, we're all going inside. Um, does not work as well as Andrew has set the stop sign and we've all worked together to set up the area that we want to play in. Um, for the fire zone, it's basically inside this, we have a big area set out with a circle around it. This is a no running zone. So once you're in areas, so everything's done, you know, with pictures and we talk through them. So it's, it's setting out boundaries at the very start and basically reinforcing them over and over to say that, you know, guys, we need to work together. The main thing is about keeping ourselves safe so that we're not running unnecessarily around a fire, which, you know, what could happen if we did. So it's talking to the children um, and having them understand and set the rules with you, you know, what do you think we should do? Should we walk in here or should we run? And it um, it works really well with the preschool children. I think that's a great idea, um, Mary. Uh, Paul, do you want to add something there, do you? Yeah, just br very briefly. I think, um, you know, as an overall umbrella, I think going back to the notion of, you know, Forest School is is all about the inclusivity and it's, it's, it's like Mary says, it's about working with them. Um, and there's no such thing as, you know, the Forest School happening and it not then including someone who you think ought to figure out how to accommodate. You actually just go into it with the assumption of we will accommodate them and we just need to figure out how because them not being included is simply not an option. And we've done all sorts of things in terms of, you know, having uh, raised um, what, um raised areas that we can use for fires where we can roll a wheelchair child up to it and so they can actually have a fire pit that's coming up to them a little bit because they can't get down to a, you know a conventional sort of one um and then things like you know the way we work with tools you know that can be quite different so i think along with the sense of at its core it's all about inclusivity inclusivity so that is the default there is also the lack of the expectation that you will always know the answers but what we do always say is talk about it and say, we will figure it out. You tell me what you need as far as you can understand what your needs are at the moment. And I'll give you some thoughts and we'll figure it out together. And if that doesn't work, we'll try something else. And if that doesn't work, we'll try something else. And so it's all about the, the culture of what we're trying to do. It's all about making sure that we are providing an opportunity for everybody to be able to get involved and, and following their interests and so on. Um, you, you've sort of dipped into the question there, um, how does the forest school pedagogy specifically cater to the diverse learning needs of the children, um, particularly children with um, additional needs and so on? So, um, Mary, you tipped into that a little bit as well. Do you want to look at that in in your presentation? You, you tipped into that one a little bit. Um, as regards the sensory play. Um, yeah, so like looking at the sensory play, yeah. Yeah. The sensory play in particular, we, we notice that the children naturally, like I can have different areas laid out, you know, for the children to manipulate, but you'll always find that, you know, particularly children maybe um, who are on the spectrum or, you know, who have sensory processing disorders, they normally gravitate towards the more natural areas, you know, where the trees are, things like that, where it's almost a sense of peace where they're relaxed. Um, so whether it's they're bringing over a, a you know a, a book or a stick or leaves and just sitting there relaxing, we had a, a child there the last day who struggles in large groups, and you know her and one other wee child, and it's just we, we've got her to the stage now where she she plays with one other child, so it was it's a, like a slow process, but for, you know you finally find her now she has a wee friend. And the two of them were at the very far back of the gardens, just sitting on top of the rock. And it was my my employer walked over to them and asked them, what are you doing way over here? And they were like, we're just watching the birds. And something like that for a child who gets overwhelmed so easily, who wasn't making friends, who didn't like to be in groups, um, just enjoying that simple, just sitting back, enjoying the day. And for her, it was just, we're simply watching the birds. We had a, another child there started with us last September and is just finished now. Um, and this child in particular had ex 
for it was not a, a very aggressive child, but um, had a lot of frustration, um, struggled with his anger, uh, different emotions, and did not like the idea that he was going to be cooped up in a classroom. So we were like, right, we'll try you with one of our outdoor classrooms. And the girls started the approach first, you know, bring him into the area, talking to him, you know, finding out his interests, what areas he loved. And the more he realized that he had the freedom, they, they roamed the area, explored for himself and use the resources there as he seemed fit. His, his emotional struggles started to, you know, dissolve in front of our eyes. And it was lovely to see that, I think it was by March time, his parent actually came to us and the worry was then was how was he going to transition to school? Because for us in the preschool area, it's so much different. You know, we're catering to their individual needs. We're allowing them that emerging interest. You know, we're focusing on that, where they want to play and supporting wh whichever learning that they see fit, you know, supporting their, their interest. And for her, it was now he was going to a classroom that had 30 children. They were, it's a more formal style of education behind the table. And, you know, it was, for me, was it kind of like, well, do we start introducing them now or do we keep going following with, with the pedagogy that, that we believe in? Um, so, like, we found that, you know, different children, um, and particularly on the spectrum or with behavioural issues or attention issues, it's when they were outside, because there was no, the area wasn't too over, you know, with when you're in the classroom environment, there's too many posters up, there's too many pictures up, there's so much noise. They, really they get overwhelmed. Them. They get overwhelmed. Ah, yeah, they yeah. get overwhelmed yeah. and you get... You know, at the end of the, you know, sometimes you're in the classroom and you get frustrated because you're like, I just need to go outside, get a bit of fresh air, go for a walk, look around you. And even just that, you know, with that biophilia, that um, that theory he had as well, it was just that, you know, you, you naturally gravitate to nature. And it's funny that we do it now in our classrooms or offices. There's a plant beside us because it gives us that sense of calm. But that's what children crave every day is that sense of calm and relaxation. And that's. I think, I, think, I think it was interesting there the way Paul um, made reference to the child. Um, you made reference in your presentation, Paul, to that child that wanted to sort of sit on their own for a while and sort of um, chill out nearly, you know, just to sort of relate back and, and reflect on the experiences they were having. Um, how do you think or what do you think about the sensory aspect of um, the outdoors supporting children with individual needs? Well, I think so much of, um, well, life in general, obviously, especially education, is cognitive. It's all up here that actually to be in our bodies um, other than a PE class is, um, you know, a rare opportunity. So that idea of whether you call it a mindfulness or presence, but um, often I, I picked up many years ago and I love the, the phrasing of this, which is rather than doing, just being. And by default, the flexibility of forest school, it's not about any outcome. It's about where do we start and how do we take the next step rather than we have to get to this point, so we have to work our way back. By default, the um, the approach for a school is who is it that we're working with, where are we, and where do we go from here? And so it's very hard to you know discuss about a particular approach that for a school takes because it is very DNA. It is how do we work with these people. So there isn't a particular strategy or there isn't a particular um, you know, model to use with Forest School. It is at the core of its values all about this person that we're working with. What is it they need for me today? Yeah. And in terms of the, um, I see a question here looking at, say, uh, expanding on the how it promotes social interactions and collaboration um, with, with different children um, and it limiting the individual um the individualized institution or instruction for for children um, with inclusion um how do you how do you see that uh, supporting say social interaction from um maybe expanding on that a little bit so i think one of the the key things and it's not in the qualification uh, it's not in the principles but it's it's looking for how can you prompt natural interaction um, rather than try to force it. So, for example, play, you've got, you know, different ways in which people might play together, parallel play. You might uh, have onlookers, you know, actually start to might have some kind of interaction between them. And it's about observing those kind of things 
um, giving whatever kind of support, and sometimes that can be as simple as a look. Um, but it could also be, for example, when you start to uh, put knowledge out there into the group, and you know, if they come to me and they say, "Oh, what is this?" or "How do I do this?" It'd be very, very easy for me to say that. Rather, I might say, "Oh." Do you know what? Go and ask Mary. I think she was looking at this the other day. Or go and ask little Jack over there. He's really, really good with that tool. I'll watch, but you know he can teach you. So it's looking for those really informal ways that um, you know they don't even doesn't even occur to them is is what you're actually doing. Then that tends to sort of bypass some of the um, uh, sort of uh, concern that they might have of any kind of formal setting for setting up kind of social interaction. It's all of the very, very informal, subtle things, which I think take you know, forest school practitionership into a kind of art form. Um, it's those little subtle things which I find always make the big differences. I think too, Mary made a good point earlier on when she was talking to about the whole idea that they they don't necessarily see it as a, as a, an activity as such, that they're being judged mm -hmm. and they engage more readily because they don't see it as being a failure as such if they can't um, maybe, you know, do something the first time round. Do you want to elaborate on that, Mary? Sorry, my plumber's here, so I got distracted. <laughs> <laughs> um he's literally just left there um yeah so for for me um so i i work alongside all of the educators in our service um indoors and outdoors and my key role now in the service would be do a lot with training and enhancing experiences and you know trying to think outside the box when we're when we're working with children I hate the idea of activities because it's almost look like it's for me it's like look what I've set you up and look what you're going to finish today so we can show your mommy a picture of it or show her what you did at the end of the day I'm going to take a photograph put it in your journal and talk about all the lovely things that you learned because I made you do it um for me experiences it's always about having resources having kits um like for our outdoor classroom areas we have different boxes you know so different items for the mud kitchens um so all, all in one container pictures on it they know exactly at the end of the day when they're finished their mud kitchen these items go back in we tidy up the area so we're, we're big indeed like leaving no trace um so rather than activities that as you said before has a start finish and end that's it done you have completed your puzzle next time we're going to move on the an eight piece puzzle um but like like the more and more i work with children um you, you see the idea that to build resilience to build resourcefulness to build imagination it's i love the idea of boredom children now everything's fast learning immediate you know they're scrolling through things they're finished with one activity i'm bored what do i do next you don't get that outside um do you know if a child's bored well what do you think we could do or sometimes what i would do is i, I love climbing trees not really good at it anymore um but i would model behavior you know go over to the different areas and you know try out different things and what you normally see is children have naturally gravitate towards adults in their rooms so it's it's all about modeling you know well we go, there's lovely hills will we go and roll down the hills or will we you know dig wee hot mix wee huts for the hedgehogs that we know might have been here last night or build wee things like that um experiences for me it's there's no right or wrong way to do it i'll experience something differently than what you did you might have a terrible time making the mud faces because you didn't like getting your hands dirty where another child will have head to toe covered in the mud um but for for the them two children they learned different things had different experiences and i'm able to observe going how can I move forward with this? How can I get Margarita next time not afraid to get her nails dirty where she might introduce her, you know. Well, you know her too well. <laughs> <laughs> I had that experience. Um, but it's, it's for me, it's just about finding out who the children are, what they love to do, and how can I enhance that for them? And I'm, I'm naturally very creative. I love thinking of really outside of the box ways. And it's not about what I have equipment wise or resource wise it's what can i use that's available around me or you know recyclable or you know 
free of charge, like the leaves fall on the ground, it makes a lovely um, add on for your your tough tree, you know, for the children, even the crackle to hear the sounds, that kind of thing. So um, experiences, if, I think for a child as well, it's there's more confidence going on. You know, there's not that fear of I'm going to do this wrong. For them, it's I'm going to do this how I want to do it. And I, I love that, mm-hmm. giving that children. I that think that's the important <laughs> thing, isn't it? That whole idea that it's like how they want to do it, you know, and there's no sort of right, wrong or do it the same way as like a template would tell you. Um, it's all about exploring and see what happens. Um, I have a, a, one last question, because we're going to sort of have to tidy up sh- shortly. But I, I wanted to direct this to Paul, please. Um, for for those people who don't have a very large outdoor area and don't have, like, say, the eight acres that, that Mary has to, to play with, how would you advise them to sort of incorporate this whole idea of forest education into their traditional educational setting? Um, the first thing I would say is stop mowing the grass. <laughs> uh, You're as bad as my son. <laughs> which, which, which can be a huge paradigm shift, especially to the caretaker who's probably you know done it lovingly for many decades. Um, there are certain practical things you can do. So the, the physicality of the space doesn't necessarily need to be very large, but the richness of it is what is really crucial. So earlier on, I was talking about you know loose parts and things. Just start putting into a certain area as many natural loose materials as you can. So whether that's leaves, mud, sticks, logs, you know, rocks, anything that you can. Um, one of my um, sort of best tips is always talk to local tree surgeons and the local council forestry team. You know, they always have lots and lots of materials which they've got to do something with, process it. If you can say to them, well, if you can drop off anything and they know they shouldn't bring anything poisonous or, you know, if you can drop it off at um, you know our setting, that's a great win for everybody. The setting is enriching itself, not just in terms of a learning resource, but also just in terms of biodiversity, because all of those nutrients are going to rot down, break down into the soil. That's maybe going to encourage new growth, et cetera, et cetera. So the, yeah, the physical dimensions don't need to be, they can be quite moderate, but the richness of the learning space will go beyond its physical dimension. Um, and then from that, I think one of the key things to maybe start doing is just start taking a step back. And and like Mary's been talking about, you know, let them take the lead. They will come up with ways of using things that you wouldn't think have many creative possibilities in them. But when you start to layer in all of the different social and emotional aspects, you know, plus all of their fantastical imaginative ways of interpreting the sensory, the physical, the balancing, the, uh, the throwing, all of these kind of things, if you provide them with the, the the loose parts, they will create an entire landscape for learning themselves. I remember years ago doing an activity with a couple of, um, well, a group of, uh, we did it with the teenagers and then we did it with the uh, the early years children. I have to say the early years children had a way better imagination than the teenagers did. But we basically put them into a field and we told them to head off there and find whatever they could to come up with different activities, different games, different whatever, you know, and the 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 youngsters, they were just in their element. They had stones and twigs and branches and bits of grass and whatever. And the teenagers were all standing there looking around at each other going, what are we going to do? <laughs> the only thing that I would so say, sad. Uh, the only thing I would say is, you know, try to try to avoid to prescribe them materials. So my my rule is always no ribbon, no glitter. Let them use yeah. the natural materials as much as possible. Whatever's available to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you very much um, to both of you. Your presentations were brilliant, very interesting, and we're delighted to have you with us there this evening, um, Paul and Mary. Um, I think Andrew's going to sign us out here. Yeah, well, I just want to say uh, thanks to Paul and to Mary for their time. Um, and then thanks to Margarita as well there for facilitating the questions at the end. And also I want to say thanks to everyone who joined us tonight and everyone who put in questions in the chat. There is really some really insightful questions there at the end. So thank you very much for everyone who um, who contributed there at the end. And if you know anyone who missed this recording or webinar and would like to, or if you'd like to watch it again, this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in the coming days. And we'll also be sending um, CPD certs in the, um, sending out CPD certs in the coming days as well as a cert- certificate of attendance. 
for this very interesting webinar. So thanks again to everyone who joined and to, their, to our speakers as well, to Paul and Mary. So we hope everyone um, has a great week and found this very insightful. Well, no, I did. I know there's definitely a lot, um, a lot that I didn't know before coming in here. And I, I think I feel like I know a lot more about the topic now and I hope everyone else does. So thanks. Um, so thanks. Thanks again.